uh, retrospectively. Um, so um, our next uh, pair of talks is, is around sleep and um, it's, it's going to be a double act. Um, our first speaker of the double act is um, Anna Marie Costa. Anna Marie is Associate Professor at the Department of Social Medicine at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. Um, she's also a member of the management team of the Maastricht study um, and she is a part of the senior leadership of ProPass. Um, the second speaker of this double act uh, is uh, Manos Damatakis, who uh, you would have heard earlier, is a professor of physical activity, lifestyle and population health and uh, NHMRC leadership fellow at Charles Perkins Centre, University of Sydney. Um, Manos uh, directs ProPass uh, and he was also, like Peter, heavily involved in the WHO 2020 physical activity and sedentary behaviour guidelines group. Um, so, uh, Anne-Marie, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, sorry, I have to start with my first slide. <laughs> um, I'll be talking about device-based evidence for sleep guidelines and uh, specifically on how good accelerometers are for sleep measurement. And um, this will not be a full overview, but a brief overview of, of what we know. So why do we talk about sleep research? Um, I wanted to start my presentation with uh, referring to this recent editorial in The Lancet um, with the title, Waking Up to the importance of sleep. And it basic, this is the last paragraph of that editorial, basically saying that an activity that takes so much uh, time of our, of our lives, it receives so little attention in, in research and in medicine. And it says that, that it's important to, to study it, assess it and, and treat it and give it a more prominent um, place in, in modern medicine. And I think with uh, the cohort studies, and the, the, you have seen many examples already today that have the 24-hour accelerometry data, we can actually uh, have an important contribution to this. So the importance of, of sleep is also shown by the integration of sleep now in movement guidelines. And I refer here to the Canadian 24-hour movement guidelines that now not only have guidelines on physical activity, sanitary behavior, but also incorporate sleep. And Looking at the evidence, uh, what is based upon, so the, the, the report that belongs to this, it shows that similar to the evidence on physical activity and sanitary behavior, it's based on self-report mostly. Most of the studies, so 96% of the studies that provides evidence um, are based on self-reported measures of sleep. So when we talk about the measurement of sleep, the gold standard is the polysonography measurement. Of course, it is a good measurement because it um, it registers also brain activity, but it's invasive because it's often done in a laboratory situation, uh, although there are also ambulatory assessment methods at the moment, but it's still a rather invasive measurement. Instead, wrist accelerometry has been used. And, um, when you look at validation studies comparing wrist accelerometry to polysonography uh, assessment, you see that it's sensitive to determine sleep time, but the specificity to determine wake time is low. But all in all, we can, we can conclude that it's a useful and valid means to measure sleep duration. I think sleep quality is still debatable whether it's, it's, it, it provides really good measures of, uh, measure of sleep quality. And this field is fully still um, developing. Uh, for example, now that, there, that there's work going on looking at sleep stages, for example, A. and Dorothy in his, Dorothy and his, his group uh, are looking at that, and also Manos Tamatakis is planning some work in Sydney on this. So there's still, I think, uh, will be lots of development in the future. But what about uh, uh, measuring sleep with thigh-worn accelerometers? Um, I give you an example uh, of, of our own study first. Uh, there were algorithms to de define bedtimes. Um, when we started to analyze data from the first 3,000 participants having active PAL data in the Maastricht study, we were mostly interested in uh, physical activity and sanitary behavior. So we wanted to get rid of the sleep time or in bedtime. 
And at, the, at that moment, there was no algorithm yet. So we, we de developed our own, um, which was published back in 2016, and we're still using uh, uh, yeah, until now. And we validated this against self-report, and it worked pretty well. But important to note, that, of course, is that this in-bed time is not necessarily sleep time. Um, however, we started to look this, uh, at, at this in-bed time uh, in relation to type 2 diabetes in our study, which you see, which you see on the left panel, um, looking at in-bed time in relation to the prevalence of type 2 diabetes. And uh, as a reference here, you have eight hours of, of, of sleep or in-bed time. You see that longer sleep and shorter sleep were both associated with uh, prevalent diabetes as you also see in the in the self uh, in the literature uh, on self reported sleep and on the right panel you see uh, results from the 1970 british cohort study also part of propass um, also active pal data and there they looked at combined associations of mppa and sleep time and also here you see this kind of u shaped association with diabetes, although here mostly the short sleep seemed to be associated with uh, diabetes prevalence. And this, this type of work is some of the first work with uh, the thigh-worn uh, sleep or in bedtime uh, in relation to health outcomes, but I'm sure there will be much more to follow in the upcoming years. But what about really measuring sleep? And I think that's the where we have to go, and this was this is work um, uh, by Peter Johansson uh, and his colleagues who developed an algorithm to define really sleep. Uh, and they have validated this against um, uh, polysonography. And they show that this algorithm, um, uh, they, they have a good measure of sleep duration. And looking at the sensitivity and specificity was very comparable to wrist accelerometry. And also here they conclude is however less good in uh, defining uh, sleep quality. But overall, um, uh, this results in a better measurement than we have so far. And this uh, algorithm has been incorporated in the ActiPass software, where all the uh, ProPass um, data will be um, processed with. So what are the opportunities for ProPass? I think with this, we can uh, assess sleep parameters in all ProPass cohorts primarily now sleep duration, but as, as this is still, uh, the methods are still developing, I'm sure that we will also be able to look at sleep quality measures in the future, as well as regularity in sleep, for example, over, over the week. We can look at it in combination with other physical behaviors, and Joe has already uh, presented some work already on this. Um, and of course, eventually look at um, longitudinal associations with health outcomes, and thereby hopefully contributing to the to the literature on on um, objective sleep measures and health. With this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and, and give the word uh, to Manus. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, Anne Marie. <clears throat> so Anne Marie. Uh, provided much of the context of my mini research presentation. Uh, in addition to the developments, uh, the work in progress around the sleep, uh, uh, sleep algorithm uh, development uh, that happens around uh, Europe, I would like to mention a very important one that I found out about recently. So Aidan Doherty and uh, uh, Leon Strecker in Australia, uh, they, are they are working on, 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 uh, on understanding how risk accelerometers can uh, measure sleep stages. So this is, this is a major leap forward. Uh, so I will, I, I will share my screen and uh, present some results from the UK Biobank. Uh, and uh, we focus on... Uh, 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 sleep regularity, in particular sleep regularity, as an indication of what uh, dimensions of sleep beyond uh, duration, which is what the majority of the literature has focused on. Uh, Matthew Ahmad did the analysis. This is the first take of our results. And as uh, Anne-Marie mentioned, the Canadian guidelines are the only ones which have incorporated sleep. However, they have incorporated sleep based on cross-sectional evidence only, and mostly evidence about the duration. Uh, sleep is a multidimensional 
behavior like physical activity also and uh, there are other aspects of sleep that are, seem to be appear to be as important or at least we can accelerometry evidence can help us understand how important they are in relation to uh, to, to to sleep duration the most studied aspect so we, we were inspired initially to do this work uh, uh, thanks to uh, some uh, UK biobank based uh, algorithms, uh, sleep regularity algorithms published last year. And I will show you some results from the regularity index against three uh, major outcomes, mortality and instant disease outcomes. Just a bit of context to what the regularity index uh, means was developed by a, an Australian group, a Melbourne based group. Uh, very high values of the regularity index means that uh, very regular pattern. People tend to go to bed around the same time, get up around the same time every morning. Uh, uh, and uh, the less, the lower the value in the regularity sleep regularity index means that the pattern of sleep is much more fragmented, sporadic, erratic. Uh, yeah. Uh, we use the UK Biobank, uh, the accelerometry uh, data resource, and uh, it's a rich, uh, very rich linkage to um, get information about the outcomes that I will present you. So I will show you results from all-cause mortality, uh, cardiovascular incidence, and dementia uh, incidence. Uh, we have done analysis across a number of other outcomes. I think it's around a dozen dozen of outcomes we have looked at. And I would like to draw your attention in particular on the top left-hand side uh, panel of all these graphs. This is a sleep regularity index where we see that uh, we see a near linear association up to a point and the association, the higher the regularity association with all, all cause mortality seems to level off. And this data, I need to highlight that this is absolute risk. This is adjusted absolute risk, not uh, uh, hazard ratios. Uh, for sleep timing, we see a, a U-shape, mild U-shape, subtle U-shape association. And uh, for sleep duration and all-cause mortality, very interesting. We see that a higher absolute risk occurs for with uh, larger amounts of sleep than with lower amounts of sleep. And uh, in uh, the nadir, the bottom of the, the lowest risk, absolute risk, seems to agree fairly okay with the Canadian guidelines, seven to eight hours, uh, between seven and eight hours of sleep uh, every night on average in this sample of 82,000 participants from the UK, UK by bank. Now, for the, the next slide, I will flick it back and forth a couple of times just to get, show you that it seems to be somewhat different. For CVD incidence results, we see a very clear, so a very linear association between uh, regularity and, uh, and uh, CVD incidence. And pay attention to the sleep duration as well. So we see that it's the, 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 so the balance the, of the two sides of um, the sleep distribution, very uh, the very low end and the very high end, uh, seems to flip in relation to all-cause mortality. So here we see all-cause mortality. Uh, we see that uh, those who oversleep have higher risk. Those who undersleep have uh, higher risk, which is very very interesting. And for finally for dementia, we see the results for incident dementia mirror pretty much the same the the CVD incidence. Again, we see linear function for the sleep uh, regularity and uh, undersleepers have been higher absolute risk compared to oversleepers. We have also tried to better understand um, what happens, uh, it, do these uh, sleep regularity findings apply to all uh, sleep duration levels? So if uh, does sleep regularity matter uh, for those who uh, meet the guidelines, the sleep uh, uh, guidelines, seven to eight hours per day, or uh, are they independent? Is irregularity independent of the association? We cannot give you a very clear answer. Yeah, this is the first take of the analysis. Um, this is stratified analysis by sleep duration level, irregularity against the CVD incidence. We cannot see a very clear difference. But it could be that this analysis is quite crude. Here, this is a Cox analysis, Cox regression uh, hazard ratios. We don't see a clear pattern between the among the three sleep groups. So I think uh, the main reason why I want to present you this data is just to show you what uh, in which directions 
accelerometry, risk accelerometry in this occasion. And uh, I'm sure that when we have the first prospective results from the Propos Consortium, phi accelerometry can steer us towards when it comes to generating evidence for uh, future sleep guidelines using devices. A um, couple of remarks before I go. Uh, we have, uh, yeah, the accelerometers can go beyond duration, uh, cover a big gap in the evidence of mostly self report uh, sleep. And at ProPass, we are very committed. Sleep is a very core focus area. We're doing methodological work to develop algorithms, among other things. And uh, we will have a discussion about whether it's time to include sleep uh, recommendations in the WHO guidelines, perhaps at the end. Thank you for listening. Uh, that was fantastic. Thank you, Manos and Anne-Marie, for, for that overview. Um, again, if you do have questions, please post them um, uh, in, in, in the Q&A box um, and we can answer those uh, retrospectively. Um, and if you are a big on Twitter, don't forget um, uh, to post your tweets. Our handle is uh, hashtag propass uh, ispar underscore 2022.